We are privileged to have with us Brother Billy Tan as our speaker for today under the Dhamma Dana Lecture Series 2018. Here I will read out a short profile on Brother Billy. Brother Billy Tan is a business development consultant and a professional trainer who has been training corporate executives and business professionals in more than 20 countries over the past 25 years. Brother Billy is also a certified master practitioner of neuro linguistic programming (NLP) and a certified Six Sigma Black Belt practitioner, as well as a being certified in clinical hypnotherapy. In recent years, Brother Billy has conducted several professional training program for resident and visiting monks at the Buddhist Mahavihara, Bridgefields. In the area of emotional intelligence, communication, professional presentation, public relations, community services, leadership, and management. In sharing the Dharma, Brother Billy studies under the guidance of Venerable Dr. M. Punaji Mahathera, and enjoys connecting findings from neuroscience and psychology to present teachings of the Buddha from a modern and scientific perspective. Today's theme is entitled Pancha Kanda, the science of perception. Now we would like to invite Brother Billy to deliver the talk. Good evening, brothers and sisters in the Dharma. Uh, this evening's topic is uh, Pancha Kanda, which is commonly translated as the five aggregates. The five aggregates is one of those things which which is quite uh, difficult to really understand. Part of the reason is that the popular or common translation uh, use their own way of explaining it. But today I'm not going to go into the common or popular translations. I'm actually going to use my teacher's translation, Venerable Dr. Punaji. He calls the Panchakanda as the five constituents of the process of perception. Simply put, the Panchakanda is about the process whereby light enters the eye, sound enters the ear, and then we smell something, we taste something, and we, we touch something, and that produces a perception in the mind, and we begin to form concepts of what we have seen, heard, smelled, tasted, or touched. That's basically what Panchakanda is about, that process whereby perceptions form in our head based on stimulations from the environment. So a more precise explanation of the meaning of the term Panchakanda is the five constituents of the process of perception. And there are really five elements or five constituents. I will go into the more, de the more detailed explanation of each constituent uh, later on. But to begin with, we always, uh, I always like to go back to the root of the Buddha's teaching. How, what is the significance of this five aggregates or Panchakanda? How does it affect us? Right? Basically, if we go back to the root of the Buddha's teaching, we will be able to see where this Panchakanda fits in, how it affects us in many ways. Where the Buddha, in the very first sermon, the Dhamma Chaka Pavattana Sutra, the Buddha taught us about the Four Noble Truths. And what are the Four Noble Truths? The first one is that there is dukkha, there is suffering. And there is the origin of suffering. Then there is, of course, an end to suffering. And finally, there is a way that leads to the ending of suffering, where the Buddha taught us the Noble Eightfold Way, right? the Sublime Eightfold Way, that can help us eventually to ultimately end suffering by attaining Nibbana. So these are the four noble truths that the Buddha has taught in the Dhammachakapavatana Sutra. In the very first noble truth, the Buddha spoke about eight kinds of suffering. And birth is suffering, aging, sickness, and death. These are suffering. Now, from a, from a mundane perspective, it's quite easy to understand how birth, aging, sickness, and death are suffering. But the Buddha went on to describe four more. Right? The next three are separation from what is pleasing is suffering, 
right? Uh, union with what is displeasing the suffering, and not to get what once is suffering. And these are fairly straightforward also. Separation from what is pleasing simply means that we have enjoyed or experienced something pleasant or something that makes us happy or something that makes us feel comfortable, and then we no longer have it. Separated from conditions that make us feel happy or feel good. Then we become angry or upset or anxious or unhappy. Then union with what is displeasing is the opposite. We have experienced things which are hurting us, which are painful, which are things that we don't like, and then we are stuck with it, union with displeasing. That is suffering. We are stuck with something we don't want. That is, this, that is suffering. And uh, the next one, number seven, is not to get what wants. All of us have aspirations of wanting something in life. Young man wants to find a wife. Young woman wants to find a husband. Old man wants to stay young. And old woman also wants to keep her hair black right, and not allow it to turn white and so on. So we all have wishes, but if the wishes are not granted, then we will experience unhappiness or suffering or dissatisfactoriness. But it is the last one, number eight, which is actually the crux of the root cause of all our suffering. In fact, the first seven are very straightforward to understand. Number eight is the one which is the, at the root of all our suffering. Basically, the Buddha said, it is this five aggregates, the panchakanda. The panchakanda subject to clinging. And of course, the Buddha calls this panchu padana kanda. That means pancha upadana. Pancha means five. Upadana simply means clinging or, or grasping or attachment or personalization. We personalize things. Kanda, these are, these are the aggregates, they call it. And basically this panchakanda subject to clinging is suffering, is dukkha. Now how does that happen? When the Buddha spoke about this panchakanda, he's referring to the process of perception. Everything we see, we hear, we smell, we taste, we touch, we experience these stimulations from the environment. And then from each of these experiences, we cling on to that experience. We grasp it and we, we call it mine, I, me, or mine. We personalize it. It happens all the time. We don't realize it, but we are doing it all the time. We are personalizing every experience. A very simple example, you wake up in the morning, you knock your hand against the wall, you feel the pain, right? then what arises in your mind? I feel the pain. What's the first word? I. You see? And you walk down the street, you kick, accidentally kick uh, your toe on the wall or, or the, the lamppost, and you feel the pain, right? and now your, 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 foot, your foot, foot is hurting. Right? Then you say, my foot hurts, or my leg is hurting if you fall down or something like that. What's the first word that arises in your mind? My. See, everything we experience, and we are able to experience things around us, we begin to cling on to it, we begin to personalize that experience and call it I, me, or mine. In fact, that situation in the 21st century has gone so bad that we even cling on to things or we personalize things that are not animate. They are not part of us. My cell phone. Don't touch my phone. My computer. My car. So all this I, me, and mine is getting stronger and stronger in the modern age. In ancient times, people were not so, so strong about it because in ancient times, people did not put so much emphasis on possessions because people did not have so much possessions. But today, we are all burdened with all kinds of possessions. Check your pockets, check your, your purses. You see how much barang barang you have inside there. Right? We are burdened with so many possessions and everything is I, me or mine. My lipstick, my eyeglasses, my cell phone, my car. Right? The I, me or mine is getting stronger and stronger every day. And this is what is causing us a lot of suffering personalizing it. Not only personalizing objects, but personalizing experiences, personalizing things that we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. You walk around the shopping mall and you see your good friend coming towards you and you look at him and say, oh, my friend is coming. What's the first word? My. You see, we personalize it so much. 
And that is the root cause of our suffering. Personalizing everything we see, hear, smell, taste, or touch. Panchakanda is about the process of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. Upadana is about personalizing, clinging, grasping, attaching. Right? And that's why this Pancha Upadana Kanda, simply put, the five aggregates or the process of perception subject to clinging, that uh, causes a lot of suffering. Now going on to the second noble truth, the, cause, the, the, uh, the conditions leading to the causes of suffering, basically it is this Panha craving, right? we react. The word panha is often translated as craving, but Bhante Punaji has very wisely investigated that and translated it to call it emotional reaction. So in other words, it's our reaction to everything we see, hear, smell, taste and touch. And when, when this reaction brings about suffering, what do we do? So the Buddha says it is this panha which leads to renewed existence accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there. Simply means if we experience suffering, we experience something that hurts us, the way we, we try to make ourselves feel better is to go and look for avenues where we can enjoy some pleasures and delight that make us forget about our troubles and our pain and our sorrow. I must admit, I personally did that when I was young before I became serious about Buddhism. Because when I was happy, of course, I have a good appetite. When I was sad, I drown my sorrows in food. <laughs> so that's really what happened to me in those days. So the same thing. Well, of course, food can be harmful to the body in the long term, but it is nowhere half as harmful as some of the things that other people are taking, the intoxicants. This is why in the five precepts, the fifth precept is so important that we should refrain from all kinds of intoxicants. Things like cigarette, beer, alcohol, drugs. So this is, all this is really going on. People seek to do things pleasurable so that they can forget about their problems and their worries. Some people drink. Some people uh, go gambling. Some people go to nightclub. Some men womanize. Some women mess around with playboys. So it happens all the time. Right? So people are always seeking ways and means to please themselves, please the body, right? in order to forget about their suffering. And basically all this panha, all this craving or emotional reaction, there are three types. Panha for sensual pleasures, of course, seeking things that makes us feel pleasurable, enjoying sensual pleasures. Panha for non-existence, this is the opposite, something which is unpleasant, we don't want it to exist anymore. Right? Things that we don't want, we wish it does not exist. And then, of course, Tanha for continued existence. And this is really about this body, the delusion of this self-centered existence. I want to live forever. I want to live longer. Uh, maybe not forever, but I want to live longer. How long? I don't know, but I want to live longer. Ask yourself, who wants to die tomorrow? Who wants to die next month? How about next year? How about in three years' time, five years' time? Nobody wants that. Everybody wants to live on. And this thing about you know, uh, living a longer life is so important to so many people. But actually, what is so important about living a longer life? By the time you get to 80, you hardly can enjoy life anymore. You can hardly enjoy things around you anymore. You go in, even going on a tour, so you, you know, your eyesight not so good, you don't see things so beautifully. And then you're not able to enjoy some of the wonderful things that many of these foreign countries or foreign places uh, offer. By the time you're 90, you can't even, you know, probably you'll be too weak to even catch a flight. So who wants, why live longer? But we do. We want to. We want to have continued existence. So these three tanhas, these three so-called cravings, they're actually emotional reaction. The first one is to things that are pleasurable. So we want to enjoy it. So it is called loba. Loba is lust turning into greed. The second one is dosa. This is aversion turning into hatred, something we don't want. We want to get rid of it for non-existence. We want it to stop existing. So aversion turns into hatred. And the third one is because of the delusion of a self-centered existence, thinking that there is this self that is experiencing the environment. 
But all that is, that is happening is that we become aware of what's going on in the environment and we are experiencing this, this environment from the consciousness. But we then start to equate this consciousness to be living inside this body, therefore this body is me. Right? Thinking that this body exists and therefore I am this body. Right? So there is this uh, delusion of a self-centered existence, moha. But tanha really means emotional reaction. That's what my teacher pointed out. So today's topic is more about this process of perception. So we go back to the first noble truth. It is about this last condition of suffering. Right? The, the pancha kanda that is subject to personalization. Upadana. Right? And where my teacher, Venerable Dr. Punaji, he has translated it precisely to mean that this Panchakanda is the five constituents of the process of perception. Now, what are these five constituents? Let's take a very quick look at the five of them, and then I will go on to talk about uh, something related to it first. So Panchakanda is commonly translated as five aggregates. Pancha means five, and then they can't find a, a word for it. They call it Kanda, means ag aggregate. So I'm not too clear how this word aggregate came about. But what is easier to understand, what is this thing called Panchakanda? My teacher, Venerable Dr. Bunaji, calls it the five constituents of the process of perception. That means there is a process of perception arising in our consciousness whenever light enters the eye, sound enters the ear, and, we, and there's smells, and there is uh, flavors, and there is touches, and then there is an awareness of objects. It is the arising of this awareness. That's what this five constituents is all about. And this arising of the awareness, basically, the Buddha described it as when we see something, Right? An image appears in our mind. So what is going on? So this is really seeing and having this perception of an image arising in the mind that is rupa. The rupa is often translated as object, matter, something physical, materiality, corporeality even they call it. But actually the word rupa is not talking about something physical that exists. Because... You know, many of us know some words in Bahasa Malaysia and a lot of words in, in Sanskrit, oh, sorry, a lot of words in, uh, in uh, Sinhalese, in many other languages like uh, Chakma language in Bangladesh, they have their uh, root source coming from Sanskrit. And everybody agrees the word Rupa means image or appearance. What is rupa in Bahasa Malaysia? Appearance. Does rupa mean a physical object? No. It means an appearance. That's what it is. Appearance in the mind. So rupa is appearance of a mental object arising in the mind. So it's really seeing an image in the mind. Because in the mind, it is a continuous flow of images. Uh, visual images, verbal images, and auditory images. We see images sometimes in color, sometimes in black and white in the mind. And we may even hear words being spoken, that's verbal. And we may even be hearing sounds, right? And that is auditory. So that is what rupa means. Vedana is translated as feeling, sometimes translated as sensation. But whatever it is, it is really a kind of feeling. But very importantly, Vedana is not an emotional feeling. I will explain this later on. And Vedana and Sanya always go together. If there is Sanya, there is Vedana. Sanya is the sensation, the sensing of something. Example, if I hit the hand, the sensing of that impact, that is Sanya, sensation, sensing the impact. At the same time, associated with every sensation, there is a feeling. This feeling is not an emotional feeling. This feeling is basically a feeling that disturbs the nervous system. So when you hit, get something hit on your hand, that feeling is unpleasant. So it's either pleasant or unpleasant. On the other hand, if somebody were to stroke your hand like that, oh, that's very pleasant. You see? 
so it's pleasant or unpleasant. So this feeling is really the feeling of the sensation, not emotional feeling. The both, both these experiences use the same word, but actually here, Vedana means feeling of the sensation, what you have sensed. In the same way, when you see light that is bright, is that pleasant or unpleasant? It's unpleasant, right? From the sensation point of view. If you hear sounds that is loud, is that pleasant or unpleasant? Right? So that is, that is the feeling of whether it is pleasant or unpleasant. Very objective feeling. So you could say this is an objective feeling. That's what Vedana means. Sanya refers to that sensation. But very often the word Sanya is translated as perception. Well, perception is more than just sensation. Perception is knowing what it is, having the, uh, having the ability to realize what you have sensed. But at the time, when somebody hits you like that, you only feel a pain, you feel a sensation, you really don't know whether it is because your friend hit you or an object landed on your hand or whatever. There is a sensation, but you don't... You know, that is, that is what sanya is. Sanya is not referring to the perception of that whole experience. So sanya is a very low-level experience. So I'm going to go deeper into this. And then all this sanya vedana, there are, every time we see something, there are millions and millions of sanya vedana right, stimulating at any one moment, and then they get put together. And that process of being put together is sankara. Right, a mental construction producing the perception. This is where the perception is. That's why it's called the process of perception. But the word vinyanya is often translated as uh, consciousness. Well, if you talk about object consciousness, so I see an object there, then I'm aware there is an object there. Uh, that awareness, that consciousness of that object, then vinyanya is correctly uh, means uh, object consciousness. I am conscious of an object. But the word consciousness being used by scientists have many meanings, many levels of meaning. At the lowest level, consciousness simply means the consciousness of some sensations. That is the consciousness of the sanya. At a higher level, there is a consciousness of what that sensation is. And that is vinyanya, the perception of that sens the, the perception formed from all these sensations. At a higher level, there is a consciousness of a self, a subjective consciousness existing, right, uh, experiencing the environment, which is the objective and uh, experience. So there is a subjective, there is an objective. That consciousness at a higher level. At a higher level than that, there is an awareness of a self in the world. Oh, I exist in this whole world, and this world is made of the, this country, that country, and I'm Chinese, I'm so-and-so, you know? So there is this identification consciousness. One level higher than that, then you begin to be conscious of, we live in this planet called Earth, and then there are so many other planets out there, so this universe is very vast. Even though we can't see the rest of the universe, we just see empty skies, or skies with twinkling stars, but we still are able to understand that there is a universe out there. So that is a higher level of consciousness. We can even take it one level higher, transcendental consciousness. We begin to be conscious of things which we cannot describe with words, beyond ability to describe. So consciousness has many levels. Right? Therefore, to say vinyanya is consciousness, just the word consciousness alone, that's not enough. Object consciousness, yes, you are conscious of an object. That's what vinyanya is, the awareness of an object. Right? So I'll come back to talk about this in great details in just a moment. Before that, I'll just very quickly go back to talk about how it all comes about. So all this, if we were to cling on to that experience, we would personalize the experience. Oh, I feel the pain. Right? The I, me, or mine, it will lead to all kinds of suffering, dukkha. And dukkha is commonly translated as the word suffering. It sounds very severe, right? Dukkha is translated as suffering, and it sounds very severe, but actually dukkha can also mean simple little thing. When you are not satisfied with what you're getting, or when you're not satisfied with not getting what you want, that is dukkha. So that is a dissatisfactoriness. That is not 
suffering, so to speak, in the sense that, oh, severe suffering. When we talk about suffering, you know, often we think of something very severe. Either somebody is very sick in the hospital, they're suffering, or maybe a dearly beloved one has just passed away, and that is suffering to us. So this is big time suffering. But dukkha can also mean simple little thing like stress. Somebody says something you don't like, and then suddenly you react to it. That is a kind of suffering. It's stress. Or that stress can lead to mental proliferation. Your mind begins to run off and you start to feel unhappy and you start to imagine crazy things. That leads to mental disturbances called distress. So stress is the body being disturbed. Distress is the mind being disturbed. So that is dukkha. So dukkha has many different levels. But if we were to... Everything we see here, smell, taste, or touch, if we will begin to personalize that experience, cling on to things that we see here, smell, taste, and touch, and start to create the concept that I, me, or mine, it will bring us a lot of uh, dissatisfactoriness. So who are we at the end of the day? And the bottom line is, we can only say we are organisms in an environment. And we interact with the environment. And this process of organism interacting in the environment in the first place, there are two important things going on. The first is metabolism. This organism depends on the body. Without the body, there is no consciousness. There is no mind. Mind doesn't stand alone. Mind is not an entity. It is an activity rising from the activity in the body. So metabolism is what keeps the body alive. Without metabolism, we are not alive. That means a dead person has no metabolism. Right? And anybody where your, the metabolism in your body stops, you're dead. Right? So to be alive means to have metabolism going on in this body. At the same time, we are all blessed with these five senses, able to sense the environment, able to see, hear, smell, taste, and touch the environment. And this is the process of perception arising. That's panchakanda enabling us, uh, that is the process that enables us to experience the environment. And that environment is very complex today. Now, just very quickly, we go to talk about the body because without the body, we cannot sense the environment. That's why we live in this world called the karma loka. Karma simply means sensual. Loka is the world, the world we live in today. Right? We are living in the karma loka. Same with the animals then because of this sensation we're able to experience, a sensual world that we're living in. And this sensual world, we need to have a body to experience it. And therefore, the main thing in this body that is experiencing the sensual world is this central nervous system, which is made of two main parts, the brain and the spinal cord. The spinal cord is connected to the rest of the body, the peripheral nervous system, and this peripheral nervous system is connected to all the organs. Now, it's very important. I'm going to talk a little bit about the science behind it because this is really very important. This will explain why Bhante Punaji translates Panchakanda in the way he does and why he explains it in the way he does and why so many other people may not have understood it because they did not connect it with science. I'm going to show you the science behind it. So, peripheral nervous system connected to all sense organs, where light enters the eye, it sends a signal or impulse through the nerves to the brain. So it's the brain that is able to process it. So as the brain processes every signal coming in, the brain sends an instruction back to the body to do something. Right? If I'm thirsty, I want to take a, a drink. Or if I want to take a picture, I pick up the camera. So the body does something according to instructions from the brain. Sometimes these instructions are intentional. That means we are aware of it. We command it. Sometimes it's autonomic. We don't think about it, but it happens. Right? So you touch something hot. Your hand withdraws. You see? So there is an autonomic reaction. And that reaction, we didn't think about it. When you touch something hot, you didn't think, ah, it's very hot, it's burning my skin. Now, if I don't take my hand away, it will burn my skin, then my skin will become all burned, then I, my skin cannot touch anything anymore. It's time to take my hand away. Do we think like that? No. The moment we touch something hot, the hand bounces out. All this is a lot of activity going on inside the body and the brain. So it's happening without consciousness because the body is reacting to it. It does not require an awareness. 
Right? Some people may argue that, oh, there is very fast activity going on. Yes, there is, but some of it actually did not even reach the brain. Some of this reaction actually is a, is a feedback arc. It, come, it reaches the spinal cord and then it causes the muscle to tense up. But then, of course, the same signal goes to the brain and then the brain processes it and causes a fight or flight reaction where now not only the, head, the finger gets away, your whole body retracts. Uh, that is, of course, being processed by the brain. So everything we see here, smell, taste and touch, it is stimulating the sense organ and the sense organ sends the signal to the brain. Right? So we have optic nerves that carry signals from the eyeball to the brain. And for the ear, we have also auditory nerves that carry signal from the, the, ears, uh, sense, uh, the ears to sense the sound and bring it to the brain. From the nose, we have olfactory nerves. And from the tongue, we have uh, gustatory nerves. And then from the body, for touches, we have many different kinds of nerves. I will come to that in a moment. So all this goes to the brain and the brain processes it. And basically, the, the brain is made of three main parts. The oldest part is the brain stem, the, the innermost part that is the brain stem. This is responsible for being, keeping us alive, responsible for the process that keeps us alive, including this metabolism going on. That means your digestion, your, your, breathe, your respiration, your heartbeat, your blood pressure, all this is controlled by this part of the brain. And then you have, of course, the limbic system, which is the emotional brain, and then you have the cerebral cortex, the thinking brain. I'm not going to talk too much about this process, this higher process of consciousness. I'm going to focus back to experiencing the environment by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. So how do we experience the environment? Let's take a simple example. Experiencing is seeing. In the process of seeing, there is only seeing. So what is seeing? Seeing is, let's say, when we want to look, we are looking at an object. So there is this dog. But every experience is dependent on the presence of the necessary condition. Being able to see the dog, it is not just having your eyes staring at the dog and the dog is out there. There is something else that needs to be present. Light. If it is pitch dark, can you see? Of course not. So you need necessary conditions to be able to see. So light is reflected from the dog entering the eye, stimulating the eye, the eyeball. So this is a stimulus. So your eye is a sense organ. And if you are paying attention, then you're able to see the dog. And then there is this process of perception and you now have a mental image of the dog. Rupa. Rupa is the mental image. Rupa, the real meaning of the word Rupa here is the mental image. But as, uh, as we all know, the word Rupa is often translated as the physical object, matter, corporeality, materiality. But actually Rupa is referring to the mental image. So let's take a look at this process. Now, this, this seeing, not only the condition of uh, light, there is another condition there, and that is attention. If we're not paying attention, we can't see. Now, I want to ask everybody who sits at the last row, one simple question. How many people in this room? Don't count. Do you know? You don't remember. Why? Because you were not paying attention. But don't you agree with me that your eyeball would have picked up the image of every single head in this room? You could have known how many people in the room but you are not paying attention. Therefore, you are not cognizing, you're not aware how many people in this room. So that is attention. If you don't give it attention, you will not be aware it's going on, even if you're staring at it. You know, two people can be talking to each other, but if they're grossly, right, they are deep and gross staring at each other and exchanging a conversation. If one of them, let's say, were to take out a packet of cigarette and wants to start to light, the other person may not be aware this person is about to light a cigarette in a no-smoking zone, <laughs> right? So there is attention. Very important thing that attention must be there. So now let's go back to, go to the root of this, all the signs behind it, the signs behind seeing. 
So bear with me if you don't like science. But this is very important. Understanding the science behind it will help you understand why Bhante Punaji translates the Panchakanda the way he does. Light enters through the eyeball and the image is, uh, is formed uh, on the, the, the reflected image is formed on the retina. And that reflected image is inversed, upside down. Right? That's what it is. We all know that when we study science in primary school, we all know that. So it, that image is formed in that part called retina, but in the very small part of the retina, in that area called the macula. And that macula is only about 5 millimeter. That's about 5 millimeter diameter. That's how small it is in the back of the eyeball. You know, if you think about the eyeball, it's about 2 inches but, uh, or 1.5 inch. But only at 5 millimeter is that image formed. Right? So this is really what the eyeball is. And that, that macula is there. And in the middle of the macula is a small little dot about the size of one millimeter. That's called fovea. It's very important to, to understand there is this thing there. And what is happening is that light enters the eye, lands on, an, and the image is formed on the macula area. Right? There are approximately 150 light-sensitive cells, rods and cone cells, two kinds of uh, light-sensitive cells, rod cells, cone cells. Right, landing on the uh, that is in the macula area, about five and a half millimeter in diameter, and rod cells sense images that are grey and blurry. They are not sharp, but right where the fovea is, there are cone cells, and cone cells is found only in the fovea area, and that fovea is only about one and a half millimeter in diameter, and there are three types of cone cells. Right. Cone cells are, are, can sense specific color range, only three color ranges, and it can sense it in sharp focus. Right? So in other words, cone cells will sense sharp focus images, and rod cells are blurry gray images. Right? So basically, that's what's happening inside the, the, the retina there. Right. And those two types of cells are sending impulses to the brain. And each cone cell is sensitive only to a specific range of uh, wavelength. And there are these three colors. that is, is, We call them color. Color doesn't exist. Color is just our interpretation referring to light belonging to a certain wavelength. So that one that belongs to the red or the green or the blue, there are three kinds, right? three ranges. So when that is happening, really what we are seeing in fovea, each, each uh, light-sensitive cell, each cone cell is really one dot. So we are really seeing dots. We are seeing pixels. So for those of, those of you who are familiar with computer images, then you know what's the meaning of the word pixel. Pixel is just a dot, a little dot. So in other words, the image is made of little dots, millions, billions of them actually. Right? And then this signal being picked up by the light sensitive cell is brought to the brain to be processed. Right? I'm going to come back to explain this one more time because after you see this video, and, and then you will understand a little bit. Then I'll come back and talk about it again. So let's take a look at this video that talk about sensation of color. Pay attention to the, the words, uh, what is being described or the narration there. Some scientists claim the simple act of seeing a colour triggers a spontaneous reaction in the nervous system. This is automatic. It isn't caused by any association, but by the wavelength of the colour. Objects reflect light at different wavelengths. Our brain interprets these wavelengths as different colours. From blue, the shortest wavelength, through green and yellow, to red, the longest. The long wavelengths, the reds and oranges, are said to arouse the nervous system. Heart rate and blood pressure increase. The short wavelengths, the blues and violets, are meant to relax the nervous system. So this is really what's going on. Let's look at what was being spoken there. 
The simple act of seeing a color triggers the spontaneous reaction in the nervous system because the light sensitive cell carry the impulses to the brain. There is a spontaneous, I mean, immediate reaction in the nervous system. This is all automatic. We can't control this. It's always happening. And this is not caused by association. Association means our mind begins to interpret what we see. Now, there is no interpretation at this point in time. This is because of the wavelength. Right. So in other words, there is no color in this world. There's only different wavelengths of the light. Light is just electrical, uh, electromagnetic radiation. And they happen at different frequencies or different wavelengths. Wavelength and frequency are just complement of each other. Right? When something triggers like that, the number of times in a second is called frequency. But when, when you want to draw it out, the, the width of it is called the wavelength. Basically, they, they, are, uh, they mean more or less the same thing. Right? Objects reflect light at different wavelengths. That means certain object, right? a, a red object is reflecting wavelengths belonging to the red range. So that reflected light enters your eye, you will then see it and identify it as red. Or blue, it will be reflecting blue. Green will be reflecting green. Black, it is more or less absorbing most of the light, so there is very little reflection. That's why it appears black. All right? White is when it is reflecting all the different frequency, it becomes white. All right? So objects reflect light at different wavelengths. And blue, short wavelength, high frequency. Short wavelength is high frequency. Blue light, right? Uh, up to the green and yellow or red, right? That is the range. So yellow and red is long wavelength, which is very low frequency. I'll come to that in a moment. The long wavelengths, the red and the oranges, are said to arouse the nervous system. Heart rate, blood pressure increase. So in other words, it is unpleasant. Red and orange light generally is unpleasant. Short wavelengths like blue and violet, they are meant to relax the nervous system, which means they are pleasant. So one is uh, uh, pleasant, one is unpleasant. Now, what is wavelength then? We look at the light spectrum of light. Right? This is basically the visible light spectrum, all that we can see. And this all that we can see belongs to a very, uh, all the different lights. Right? If, we, if we talk about very high frequency light on the left side here, the high frequency light, we can only see what is blue and purple on the high frequency range. Beyond the high frequency range, it is ultraviolet radiation, X-ray, gamma ray, and so on. On the low frequency, right, basically the long wavelengths, this is the orange and the red. Going further, it is infrared radiation, microwave, uh, radio waves, uh, television waves, and short wave radio, and so on. So these lights, this spectrum we cannot see. We can only see a very small spectrum, and in that spectrum, this is the range of light we can see, from red to, to violet. In this range here, it is soothing. In this range, it is irritating. So basically, red and orange light is unpleasant. Blue and green light is more pleasant. And now, Look at the same uh, explanation again. It is all spontaneous reaction. When light enters the eye, it is a spontaneous reaction immediately. Right? The light sensitive cells react. The central nervous system react. So this reaction is sanya, sensation, sensing of light. That's what sanya is, the sensing of light. And then whether it is pleasant or unpleasant, that is Vedana. So when it senses red or orange light, it is unpleasant. And when it senses green or blue light, it is pleasant. Now, go back to the eyeball. Right? Rot cells sense light of any wavelength. That means the rot cells are sensitive to any wavelength. It will react, but it is actually picking up uh, blurry images, rot cells. It is the cone cells that only react to certain wavelengths. So the green, the green cone cells will not react to red light. The red cone cells will not react to green or blue light. Right? So basically cone cells only react to certain wavelengths. And this stimulation of rot and cone cells causes a sensation. That sensation is an impulse, electrical impulse going to the brain. That sensation is sanya. That's why Bhante calls that sensation. Right. 
then every sensation arises with a feeling, whether that sensation is pleasant or unpleasant, whether it irritates the nervous system or it soothes the nervous system. It has nothing to do with whether you prefer or don't prefer a red light or green light. It has to do with whether it is soothing or it is not soothing. Right? So basically, sanya refers to the sensation of light and Vedana refers to the feeling whether that sensation is pleasant or unpleasant. Now, I'll come back to this in a moment to test you to see whether when you see the light, whether certain light is pleasant or unpleasant. We'll come back to that in a moment. Let's continue a little bit more. So the, the, impulses, the, the impulses being picked up by the light-sensitive cells is then brought to the brain through the optic nerves and it is processed in the brain. Right? And what is brought to the brain is the dots, bits and pieces, little dots, pixels, millions of them. Now, in each eyeball, there are 100 and, around 150 light-sensitive cells in the retina, picking up light, sending the sensations to the brain. And so at, at any one moment, there's 150 million from one eyeball. You've got two eyeballs, so now you have 300 million going to the brain any one moment. And this moment is happening very quickly. So in one second, millions of moments have happened. I, billions of it. In fact, in, in, the Dhamma, uh, in the Abhidhamma, they described it as 70 thought moments at the snap of a finger. Tens of thousands of these uh, thought moments are gone by, you see? So basically, this is every moment there is a hundred, a 300 million uh, signals going to the brain being processed. And within one second, you know, there are billions of them going to the brain. And this is really what's going to the brain. So the first part, when we see something, Right? The rupa that is arising, there is the Vedana and the Sanya associated with it. And the Sankara constructs it together, constructs this jigsaw puzzle into a complete image, Vinyanya. Vinyanya is often translated as a big picture, right? being able to discern between one object and another in a big picture. So that's really what Vinyanya is. Vinyanya is now talking about you're able to see the whole image. So you're able to discern this is one object, that's another object, there is a background, this is one color, that is another color. That is Vinyanya, being able to do that. At the Sanya level, you can't do that. So Sanya, Vedana always go together. They are inseparable. Where there's Sanya, there's Vedana. So if I strike my hand, the striking is a touch. That is Sanya, sensation. Feeling it pleasant or unpleasant, that is Vedana. Can I feel Vedana without Sanya? If I have the sanya, will I not, cannot feel the Vedana? Can I avoid feeling the Vedana? No. Right? When I strike like that, I cannot avoid the Vedana. There is a sensation, there is a feeling, pleasant or unpleasant. Right. So they go together. Sense stimulation. Let's talk a little bit about all the different senses. In the case of sight, it's reflected light stimulating the con, uh, cone and rod cells in the retina. In the case of hearing, it is sound. Sound is actually air vibration entering the ear, stimulating the eardrum. Right? And in the case of touching something, it's because our skin has many different kind of sen uh, sensory uh, nerves able to sense pressure, sensing temperature, sensing vibration, chemical, or, or being able to experience a tactile object. I'll show that in a moment. Okay? Uh, smell is because of odorant um, molecules entering the olfactory bulb where we are able to pick up a smell. Taste in the same thing, there is a chemical reaction in the tongue right? uh, because it reacts chemically in the tongue. And then, of course, all this is referring to sensation and feeling, sanya and vedana. Stimulations trigger this. Now, if you talk about sanya, sensation, it's a stimulation of the sense organ that triggers the nerve impulses that, that goes to the brain. That is what sanya is, sensation of the nerve impulses going to the brain. And therefore, in the case of sight, it is a sensation, a sensing of the wavelength as well as the brightness. So there are two things, the wavelength and the brightness. 
And now in the case of, of seeing, right, the, not only the wave, wavelength will affect whether it is pleasant or unpleasant, the brightness also, very bright light, that is unpleasant. Dim light, that is more pleasant. That's why a lot of people in their bedroom, they like the light to be dim, because it's more pleasant. You feel more comfortable, right? And hearing in the same case. Hearing, there's also frequency of air vibrations. High frequency is high pitch sound. So there's pitch, high pitch sound. Low frequency and low pitch sound. And along with it is also amplitude or loudness. Whether it is loud or soft. Now, loud sound, very loud sound. Is that pleasant or unpleasant? Unpleasant. Uh, medium, uh, low, low volume sound. Is it pleasant or unpleasant? A bit more pleasant. High pitch sound. Is that pleasant or unpleasant? Unpleasant. Low, low pitch sound. Ple uh, voice with a low pitch, right? Somebody speaks in a low tone. Is that pleasant or unpleasant? It's a bit more pleasant. It is the high pitch sound, the person with the high pitch voice. It is very unpleasant. So, ladies, if you have a high pitch voice, realize one thing your high pitch voice arouses unpleasant sensations in everybody around you. So there is two things you can do. One, train yourself to lower your pitch. Two, train yourself to speak less. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that is a reality. Uh, very quickly, a lot of politicians know that, especially those who are very smart. Many years ago, a very famous British lady, uh, politician, she was a member of parliament. She had a high-pitched voice. She went for voice training and brought her pitch down. I have a recording of her speech when she was a member of parliament. But when she get ele got elected as the prime minister of England, she, her voice was already very low pitch. She trained, went for voice training to bring the pitch of her voice down. Because high pitch sound is very unpleasant, irritating, right? right? So that is the irritation, the feeling, right? Associated with it. So red and orange and so on, right? Now, I want to do an experiment. This is not whether you like a color or you don't like a color or you prefer or don't prefer. My question to you is by just looking at the color, does it look pleasant or unpleasant? Is A more pleasant than B? Yes or no? No. Which one is unpleasant? A. Which one is more pleasant? B. Alright. Which one is more pleasant? C. Which one is unpleasant? C. So the yellow light and the red light. Now, again, which one is pleasant? Which one is unpleasant? C. Alright. C is pleasant, right? Which one is pleasant? B, see? So basically, you can see that certain light is pleasant or unpleasant. Now, now, some of you, you may like yellow. So you will say, which, if I ask you a different question, which one do you like? Some of you will say you like D, because you like yellow. Right? Similarly, loud sound is pleasant or unpleasant? Unpleasant. But young kids, they love loud sound. They play their music way up. Right? It is not about pleasant or unpleasant. That one now is the Tanha part. They love it. They have the loba for it. They like it so much. So they want the music to turn up right up. So loba has nothing to do with Vedana in this sense. right? It, it, it can be the opposite of Vedana. Something unpleasant, people may like. Right? So those of you who like yellow, you will say, Oh, I like yellow. Ah, so liking yellow is the loba. Yellow being unpleasant, that is your Vedana. So there's a, there is an important thing. Of course, generally Vedana leads to, uh, leads to your loba or dosa, but sometimes it can be the exact opposite. People who like yellow, they will say, oh, I like yellow, so that is loba. So now we have looked at Sanya, Vedana, we're going to look at Sankara, how it is all put together. Now remember now, your eyeball is fetching 300 million dots Pixel dots going to the brain being processed. So in other words, the information going to the brain is just jigsaw puzzle pieces. How the brain processes it. This explains it now. After seeing this, I think you will become more aware of what it, this construction is all about.
Ophthalmologist Dr. Bill Elwood takes a snapshot of the back of the eye. What you can see here are blood vessels running over the surface of the retina and beneath them are light sensitive cells which allow you to see. Lining the inside of each eyeball there are over a hundred million light sensing cells. But only the bigger cone cells see in colour. And amazingly only in one tiny area of each eye are there enough of these cone cells jam-packed tightly together for sharp colour vision. Most of the retina uh, gives you vision which is quite blurry, apart from this very small area in the middle. Just that smudge that we can see there. This little smudge here that gives you really fine detailed vision. And that bright spot is even odder, an area which is completely blind. That's where all the blood vessels come in and out and where all the optic nerve fibres go back to the brain. Uh, and there's so much going on there that there aren't actually any light sensitive cells in that area and that corresponds to your blind spot. So it is a very odd design. So if our eyes are designed with a blind spot and a mostly blurred image, how do we see the world in such intricate detail and vivid colour? The patchy image made at the back of the eye is just the beginning of how we see. As our eyes dart around, we make sure that anything interesting is lined up on our sharp spot so we get a good look at it. And you don't know you're doing it because the brain takes these jerky snapshots and creates a nice smooth movie of the world. And the brain also compensates for the blind spot. Because our eyes give us slightly different images, we can combine them to give one complete picture. So uh, there's only one little part of our, our retina can pick up sharp image. That's the fovea, 1.5 1 millimeter in diameter. The rest is picking up blurry gray shades and there is a blind spot. So you can see that this is the blind spot here and then this is the sharp part which is uh, in the fovea where it is color and it is sharp and picking up bits and pieces from out there. So it, your eyeball is constantly moving. You don't realize it. Your eyeball is not still. You, you're staring at something still, but your eyeball is not still. It's very jerky. But that jerkiness is so minute that you don't realize it. So this jerkiness is helping you to pick up bits and pieces of the entire image. And there have been billions of billions of them going to the brain to be processed. Right? So... At any one time, it's moving around. So you know, this is really what is happening. Right? In the same manner, because we have two eyes, we're able to see depth. Because of this perception, we're able to see the depth. And we're able to then form this complete image in the brain. Oh, now I can see everything so clearly. So you're really not seeing every, you know, the whole picture. We are never really seeing the whole picture. Sanya is not the whole picture. Sanya is just one dot in the whole picture. So I think some of you may have just realized this for the first time. We are seeing jigsaw puzzle. And this jigsaw puzzle goes into the brain and gets put together. This process of putting together is sankara, mental construction. And the big picture that is being put together is the vinyanya. And the rupa is the visual image that represents the vinyana. And that is really what is going on. Right? And it is imperfect because the eyeball is darting around in such a way, if I were to present certain pictures, you, it can create to you optical illusion. I'll show you. Take a look at this. Right? Look at the intersection. At the intersection, what exactly do you see if you focus on the intersection? You see a white dot. Okay, focus at any intersection and tell me what you notice at the other intersections. Hmm? Black dots. Now, I'm asking you, are there black dots? No. 
When you are focusing at one intersection, your eyeball actually is darting around. And this darting around is imperfect. So this imperfection is bringing to your brain, constructing it. That's why you seem to see black dots popping up at various junctions. Because it's imperfect. The imperfection. Right? I'll give you another one. So this one is called static illusion. Looking at it, it's static, it's fixed. That is an illusion. It's not real. Right? Now I give you the dynamic illusion. Right? So focus in the center. Just focus in there for a moment. After focusing it for a couple of seconds, now look around a little bit. What do you notice about this image? It's moving. Eh? Focus in the center for a while. And then you start to look around the image. And you can see it's moving. But I can assure you this image is not moving. It's fixed. But there is an illusion. So this is called dynamic illusion. Something seems to be moving around. Now I give you the interactive illusion. Let's start with this illusion. Stare at the X in the middle of the image. Do you see the green dot moving around in a circle? Now try to follow that green dot with your eyes. Nothing there, right? This illusion helps demonstrate how quickly your brain finds motion in your surroundings. Billions and billions of signal being constructed. That construction process is not perfect. And that imperfection is causing that. So that's so much for seeing. Now I think you realize seeing, uh, what seeing is? Hearing, right? Hearing is basically air vibrations. See, we often think, oh, I hear the piano. Are you hearing a piano? Is the piano entering your ear? You're not hearing the piano. You're hearing air vibrations produced by the piano. In the same way, you'd say, I see the dog. Are you seeing a dog? Is the dog entering your eyeball? No. What are you seeing? You're seeing light reflected from the dog. That is what we are seeing. We are never seeing physical objects. Therefore, the word Rupa cannot be that physical object out there. Rupa is the mental image that arises because of the reflected light entering your eye, producing that mental image. That is Rupa. Not that dog out there. But a lot of people would have translated the word Rupa, oh, to be the dog out there, the object. It's not. Realize that Rupa is not that object. And if you ask anybody from Sri Lanka, the Sinhalese language, the real meaning of the word Rupa, it's an image, perception, right, Bante? Yeah, it's that image, appearance, not that physical object. Sound is air vibration, entering the ear canal, striking at the eardrum. So this air vibration is banging at the eardrum, so the eardrum vibrates. And this eardrum vibrate will trigger a chain reaction on those three bones called the ossicles. Ossicles are three bones. That little vibration in your eardrum, that ossicle actually amplifies the vibration. So by the time it reaches the third bone, that, that vibration is very hard. And that third bone is connected to this thing called the cochlea. And this cochlea then starts to vibrate. And in the cochlea, then there are these auditory nerves. Inside the cochlea, actually, it is filled with liquid. And there's hair inside the, the, the cochlea. So when the cochlea vibrates, the liquid shakes. When the liquid shakes, it causes shaking of the hair. And each hair is connected to one auditory nerve. And there are millions of them. So millions of these auditory nerves are being shaken, and these impulses go to the brain. And these millions of these impulses going to the brain is then constructed into a sound. I hear the piano. I hear the violin, you see? That construction is Sankara, producing the mental image of a sound, an auditory image of a sound. Oh, I hear the piano, I hear the, uh, the violin and so on. Okay? So let's take a look at what the scientists are saying about the sensation of hearing sounds.
Sounds are just tiny movements of the air molecules around us. But our ears contain a wonderful system for detecting these faint ripples in the air. First, the sound waves are funneled down the ear canal to the eardrum. If they were slowed down massively, this is what they'd look like. The moving air makes the eardrum vibrate. These vibrations are then amplified by three hinged bones. The bones are connected to a curled tube called the cochlea, which is full of fluid. The vibrations of the bones send ripples through the fluid, and these ripples move rows of microscopic hair cells. As the hair cells are bent, they send nerve signals to the brain, which then works out what the sound is. It's an extraordinary contraption, but it works beautifully. So certain sounds we respond particularly because they are irritating. If I were to speak to you in a very high-pitched voice, that it sound very pleasant or unpleasant. But if I were to speak to you in a low tone, does it sound more pleasant? Right? This is why radio announcers, when they pick radio announcers, they find announcers with rich, low tone. You don't hear, I mean, unless the, ra the radio station cannot afford it, you don't hear them picking people with high-pitched voice. And one of the person with the most beautiful low pitch voice, Patrick Teo, right? Ah, low pitch voice, mellow low pitch voice. In the same way, think about it, the Chinese violin, how does that compare to a drum? Boom, boom, which is unpleasant. The ki 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 is very unpleasant. The boom, boom is not so unpleasant, right? Now you can see Vedana is the pleasantness of the sensation. It's got nothing to do with whether you like it or you don't like it. Liking it or not liking it comes later. It's an emotional reaction. That is the tanha. And that leads to your loba or your dosa. If you like it, it's lo loba. If you hate it, it's dosa. Right? So some people love violin. So they like the erhu sound. So they have a luba for the erhu, but some people don't like it. They hate it. I'm one of those who don't like the erhu or high pitch sound. So they become dosa to it. So the reaction, your reaction and my reaction are different. Same sound. We are sitting there in the orchestra. There are many drum, many instruments. There is the flute. There is the drum. There is the the the, the whatever cymbals. And then there is the erhu. And when the erhu comes on, if you like erhu, you will enjoy it. And I. Will, uh, you know, and when the drums comes on, oh, I love drums, but you may not like drums, and I enjoy it, you see. So your reaction and my reaction are different. Tanha. Your tanha and my tanha are different. Tanha is emotional reaction, and it is dependent on the person, subjective. Tanha is a reaction that is subjective, not dependent on the object itself, not dependent on the sound, dependent on how you react to it. Now we talk about touching. So touching is all these different senses. Sensing temperature, thermal. Sensing uh, uh, vibrations. Sensing pain sensations. Sensing chemicals. Sensing pressure. So all these put together form the uh, mental image of a tactile object. You touch something, oh, it's very pleasant, right? So if what you touch is soft and uh, furry, then it is pleasant. If what you touch is sharp and pinching because it starts to poke on your, your pain receptors, uh, that is unpleasant. But then you know some young people, they love pain. Ah, they like pain. Right? Masochist. They, they enjoy the pain. But pain is unpleasant. But for some of us, small little pain or so, we cannot tahan or cannot take it, right? So that is really touch. I, I won't go too much further into smell and taste. It's all come back to the same thing, right? It's all this being put together in the brain and form, and that the putting together is a sankara and form the mental image, right? The forming of this big picture in the mind is vinyana, and then you have a mental image of rupa, of what you have seen, heard, smell, taste, or touch. 
Right? So this rupa is what you have seen, heard, smelled, taste, or touch. Basically, that's really what a panchakanda is really all about. And mind is really an activity. The mind being processing this. The mind is not an object. It is not uh, an e existence. It is not an entity. It doesn't exist. But unfortunately, when you ask people, where's your mind? They point up there. But you're not pointing to your mind. You're pointing to your brain. The brain is an organ. It exists. It's something you can, you know, something it is there, physically there. But your mind is the activity of the brain. In the brain, there are brain cells exchanging chemicals, exchanging electrical impulses. So in other words, two things are being exchanged, electrical impulses and chemicals. And this activity is producing this experience of mind. The mind is not something you, you can point to, you can describe. It is something you can experience. And the Buddha basically said, mind is an activity and we can experience this activity. There are three parts of this mental activity. The first one is called Vinyanya because of Panchakanda. You now have this perception of what you have seen, heard, smelled, taste or touch. You perceive objects through your sense organs. And then these objects get interpreted. So the Mano is the part of the mind, the cognitive process which interprets Right? Cognition is the interpretation of what it is. Conception is then creating a story behind it, giving meaning to it. So basically, it is interpreting what was perceived by the sense organ, the rupa, and then giving a meaning, giving a label to it, calling this a mouse, right? uh, and calling this a computer, a microphone, uh, a whiteboard. Name we give to something is to interpret what we have perceived. Right? And, of course, we have also the chitta, which reacts to the sensation, pleasant or unpleasant. So the chitta reacts. This emotional reaction for, uh, from this emotional excitement that is excited from pleasant or unpleasant sensations. And these pleasant or unpleasant sensations are the feeling called Vedana. And this gives rise to whether you like it or you don't like it. So some people like red light. Some people don't, right? Some people like high-pitched sound. Some people don't. Some people like loud noise or loud sound. Some people don't. And at the same time, we personalize every experience, upadana. So therefore, this is why we call this pancha upadana kanda. Or in one word, panchupadana. I can't pronounce it. Pancha upadana kanda. Right? So basically, that's really the clinging on, the personalization of everything we see here, smell, taste, and touch. Now, how the mano works? The mano works not on one sense alone. It takes all the senses together. And that is what the sixth sense is all about. The five senses are the individual organs picking up stimulations from the environment. But they are put together in the mano. So the mano is actually working on all the five. Right? So basically... These six are called salayatana. And with the eyeball, it brings in a visual sight. Uh, with the ear, it has sound and so on. So the five senses comes in and they are put together by this process called the mano, cognitive process. So what the mano does is actually putting it together, interpreting it. This interpretation is called papancha and then giving meaning to it. The meaning given is called dharma. Actually, it should be small d. It should not be the big d. The small d usually means that experience. The word dharma, uh, in this case, can be translated as experience. You now experience cognition. That means you are aware of, the, of something you have seen, heard, smelled, taste, or touch. And basically, this sense consciousness, mano vinyanya, is to be able to realize that you have perceived an object, the perception is coming from your sense organ and then the conception, creating ideas and thoughts behind it. And this is what was recognized by the categorization of what was perceived, conception. That's what Mano does. Each sense organ produces perception and then the perception is put together becoming conception. Mano Vinyanya, the conception. Right? And each of this uh, each of this perception is the chaku vinyanya, the gana vinyanya, the jiva vinyanya. These are the perceptions of each sense organ. So that's why the word vinyanya is perception. Right? So let's take a look at the, the flow chart of what happens when we experience the environment. 
activities in the environment stimulate our sense organs, Panchakanda arises, we then have perception, vinyanya, of having seen something out there, heard something out there, so we're able to see, hear, smell, taste and touch. Right? And at the same time, the mano tries to interpret it because what is arising in the mind is a, a rupa, a mental image of something you have seen. So what does the mano do? The mano interprets it by, with the process called papancha, referring to memory of past experiences to give it meaning. And that meaning given is, is dharma, right? And giving meaning to it. So this process of interpretation is recognition, recognition. That's what it is, recognition, papancha. And at the same time, creating an idea of what it is, giving meaning to it, is conception. Right? So you have con cognition and conception. Now you have the concept. So what you have seen is the mental image, the rupa of the dog, but your mind gives it a name. It's called a dog because that's the nama. So giving the name is the nama. Now, Nama really means a label or a name you give to something you have identified. That's really what Nama is. But very often, a lot of people who have translated the Panchakanda, they call Nama as uh, mentality, right? mental or mind. It's really not mind. It is really concept con uh, conception, giving concepts, creating concepts. It's not just the mind. It's creating concepts. It's not really about the mind. The mind is vijnana, mano, and citta. And nama is really the concept being created from what you see here, smell, taste, and touch. And with every stimulus, there is a pleasant or unpleasant sensation. And that's where the citta reacts to it. And the citta reacts to it, and then you begin to like it or you don't like it. Right? So in other words, it's no longer because of Vedana alone, but you begin to like it or not liking it depending on your own experience from your past. And that's why your own experience from the past comes from your memory, and then you start to have imagination, you start to have expectations. So these three things arise in your mind because of what you have now experienced. Pleasant or unpleasant, and then you begin to interpret it, you like it or don't like it, then you have loba, dosa, or moha. And when you begin to like it or don't like it, you begin to react to it. And so this is from perception to consequence. Stimulus from the environment produce vinyanya, and then you have this process going on. And you begin to react to it. So chetana is your mental reaction. Kama is your physical reaction. So chetana is the thought of loba, dosa, moha, and karma is the action. Now you go and grab it because you want it, or you push it away because you don't want it. And they lead to consequences, vipaka. And these consequences will come back and haunt you eventually. So this is really what panchakanda is about. Panchakanda, because we cling on to it, upadana to it, and therefore it leads to consequences in life. So, in a nutshell, this is really what the, the Buddha taught about this Panchakanda subject to Upadana, right? The five, uh, in common term, five aggregates subject to clinging. But Ban Ban uh, Bandipunaji would call it personalization of the five constituents of the process of perception. Because it's so long, it's a mouthful, but it's very precise meaning when he says, personalizing or personalization of the five constituents of the process of perception, leading us to react, tanha, and the reaction is loba, dosa, or moha. Right? And with that, I end my presentation. I hope this has been helpful to you. Thank you very much for paying attention. Sadhu bante. Right.